Good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Let's pray and uh, <clears throat> we'll play a worship song and then we're going to get into Matthew 23. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for today. I thank you for your greatness and your glory and your amazing power and presence in our life. And we worship you today and love you. We give this time to you and we ask God that you would be honored and pleased with everything that we bring. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's uh, sing this worship song and then we'll come right back and we'll get into the word.
This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down You are all I'm chasing now This is my surrender This is my surrender Father, thank you again for today, for your goodness in our life. Thank you for your presence. Um, thank you for this time to be in your word, and thank you for providing your word for us to have access to. We're grateful. God, I ask that as we read your scripture, you would speak to us, and Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Guess what today is? Opening day for duck football. Super excited about that, and I know you are too. Uh, plus, we got some other good games. Georgia versus Clemson. That should be a good game. A um, bunch of other good games. Colorado played the other night. Travis Hunter making catches um, like I've never seen. <laughs> Pretty insane. Uh, anyway, some of you really don't care. But anyway, I'm super excited because I've been waiting for a long time for college football to start back up, and I'm excited to watch the Ducks. All right. Let's jump in this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 23. We're talking about um, leaders, leadership, and hypocrisy, and uh, some things that are in the Bible. So I'm going to try to stay super close to what the scripture says not get real opinionated necessarily, but just try to teach what the Bible says about this because um, I think you have to be careful when uh, speaking against or about other leaders. Um, that's God's business. He's the one who places people in authority, the Bible says. And so, um, you know, he's going to hold those accountable and he's going to uh, judge those who are in leadership positions based on what they're doing. So not my job. Uh, but there are some things written here in the Bible that talk about leadership, talk about things that uh, leaders do and what's going on. And so um, let's take a look at this. Um, now remember, Jesus is in his last week before the crucifixion. On Monday, Jesus entered into Jerusalem there was shouting, there was praise, people were worshiping, they were yelling, they're excited about the coming king. On Tuesday, Jesus goes into the temple and he just disrupts everything that the religious leaders who are in control of everything in the temple um, are doing. Uh, all their money changing tables and all of the merchants and he flips all this stuff and says, why are you making my father's house a den of thieves? And he gets upset that they have um, taken advantage of the people and they're making money off the people in their religious efforts. Um, and then Jesus takes it upon himself to <clears throat> uh, have the right and the authority to teach and to heal in the temple. And so at this point, the leaders are pretty upset, right? You can imagine that the civil and the religious leaders of the time are like, wait a second. This guy is claiming to be king. This guy's in here disrupting our religious experiences. All these masses are starting to follow him and they're getting scared. The religious leaders and the civil leaders are thinking, this guy's causing a lot of people to follow him and a lot of people are excited about what he's doing. And if he causes them to rise up against Rome, then Rome is gonna march against us. And when they defeat us, this is what the religious leaders are thinking. When they defeat us, they're going to take away, strip us of our positions of leadership, and um, we'll be removed, and they'll place new people in. And so these leaders are threatened. They are feeling threatened um, because in their minds, they have great risk of losing their power, their position, their wealth, and they want nothing to have nothing to do with it and so the the tragic thing is they were supposed to be god's representatives and messengers at the time 
but they'd become so far removed from who they were and what they were supposed to be that they didn't even recognize God's son when he's walking the earth. And so they begin to plot to kill Jesus. Now we're going to read Matthew 23, starting at verse 1. And Jesus at this point is now speaking to the multitudes, okay, not the religious leaders, but the, the large crowds that are following him and listening to what he teaches. And here's what Jesus says. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and he said to the disciples, saying, this is Matthew 23, verse 1. The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do and observe, do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments, they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. All right. So this is intense, right? Jesus is like, he's laying it down and he's calling out the leadership of the time. And he says, scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, what chair did Moses have? Remember, Moses was a spokesperson for God. He was a prophet and a leader to the people. And he spoke with God like a friend, the Bible says, and he brought God's message to the people. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and through Moses, he taught the people how to live according to the law. So Moses held this leadership seat as a representative of God and a mouthpiece a spokesperson for what God was teaching the people. And the Bible says here that these leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, had placed themselves in the chair of Moses. Now, there is a chair of Moses. There is a leadership position. And here God says that they put themselves there. And they're going to be held accountable God put Moses in his chair. Remember that. Remember Moses left Pharaoh and Egypt and then saw the burning bush. And God called Moses to be who he was and set him in his seat. But the Bible says here that they placed themselves in their seats. And it's interesting because God, he recognized, he says it right here. He says, they have put themselves in the seat of Moses. So they are in a leadership position. And it's a serious thing to take a position of an office or a leader, whether you're a pastor or a prophet or a teacher or evangelist or apostle. If God places you there, then you're held to a higher standard. If you place yourself there, you're still held to a higher standard. It's the same standard. And so these guys have placed themselves in the seat of Moses, and God's holding them to a, a higher standard. And here's what he says. He says, do what they say, but don't do what they do. They didn't do what they taught people to do, but they held people accountable or to these high standards of the law and then some. They were hypocrites. But we can learn something from this. A leader's bad behavior does not void his good teaching. Many good teachers have had bad behavior. And this is what Jesus is saying. Do what they say, but not what they do. Thousands of people have been saved after hearing the teaching or message from a leader, a leader 
who later it was revealed they had bad behavior. So does that void the fruit of what came from what they said that was aligned with what God said? No. Are they now going to be held accountable? And are they in a, a tough situation? Yes. But that's what Jesus is saying here. Do what they say, not what they do. People do things. People say things sometimes with wrong motives, but it's still the right thing that's being said. King Saul, for example, was motivated by fear and jealousy. Balaam was motivated by greed. Judas was motivated by money. Simon the sorcerer was motivated by prestige. Leaders do things, sorry, say things and, and do things with wrong motives sometimes, but when it's God's word that they're teaching, that word is a higher authority than the person speaking it. Philippians 1.15 says, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. This is Paul speaking, and clearly Paul's motive is that the gospel and that Christ is preached. It's not that he has the position of authority in the eyes of the people. He says there's people out there trying to bring you to them, lure you to them, as they teach and he says their motive is selfish they have selfish ambition and he goes they want to stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains and he's like but that's not my motive my motive is that you that Christ is preached and because of this I rejoice and so you see that Paul's heart is right where those he's speaking about theirs is not but we have to be careful not to become bitter towards all leadership. Most leaders are doing their best in love. That's true. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Most leaders are doing their best in love. And there is authority and godly um, establishment of leadership and submitting to leadership and following leaders. But leaders do fail sometimes. But they also get restored. Look at Peter. Peter denied Christ three times. But then what happened? Jesus found him after he was resurrected, and he restored him. King David had a moral failure, and then led well at the end. And there's a bunch of different leaders in the Bible who made massive mistakes, repented, humbled themselves, and were eventually... Uh, they did better towards the end. But could you imagine the social media post about King David at the time that he had his moral failure? I don't know that there would be any coming back from that. I don't know. But leaders do fail, and they can be restored and are restored in the Bible. Point two. Jesus says, they do their deeds to be noticed by men. So they're proud leaders. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi 
by men. So, first of all, I know everybody's saying, what in the world are phylacteries? <laughs> right? That's, a, that's what I'd be thinking. Phylacteries are like these little leather boxes that they would hold tiny parchment with scripture written on them, and they would wear them around their head or tied to the left arm of their garments. So, they would broaden their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor and banquets. What's, what's being said here? Their deeds were being done to be noticed by men. How many deeds are done to be noticed by men rather than God? So much. Whether you're a leader or not, humanity is guilty of this. Many things that we do are done so that we can be noticed by people. Why? Because we like the praise. And so did the leaders at the time. They wanted the praise. And so they brought in their phylacteries. They lengthened their tassels. They changed their clothes. They wore fancy things, building up their reputation, wanting to be noticed by others as better or higher or to be respected and looked up to. It's another form of being noticed by men. Wearing, let me say this though, wearing your favorite clothes or expressing yourself through what you wear or your artistic expression or whatever from your personality is different than trying to stand out to gain respect and earn honor and have people worship you. So wearing nice things and all that kind of stuff is fine. It's an expression of our personality when we have the options to do this kind of stuff. But their motive was not that. Their motive was to be respected and build their reputation and gain places of honor so that as it says they could have the seats of honor at banquets they love the place of honor the special seats the look at me seats right thrones of pride that's what they are thrones of pride and they like the chief seats in the synagogues respectful greetings in the marketplace they love to be called rabbi by men Look at these things that Jesus is calling out. They're super specific and very easy to spot. They're super easy to spot. Does a person love to be called by their title? Do they love to be noticed when they walk into the room? Do they love to be honored and respected? Do they love to be the guest of honor? All things that point to the fact that they love to be worshipped, and it's idolatry, and it's dangerous. Look at what Ezekiel says about Lucifer. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, a guardian cherub for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, for, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth and made a spectacle of you before kings. Because of your beauty, because of your, what God had given him, he became proud. It's something to keep an eye out for when we follow a leader. It's something to search our own hearts for when we're leading. We should be servant leaders. The Bible says, do not be called rabbi. For one is your teacher. You are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Now, does this mean that there are no teachers, that there are no fathers, like I have a dad? Uh, does this mean that there are no leaders? That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, do not be called rabbi. And, and that word is my master. 
he, he's like, your aim should not be for people to call you my master. Your aim should not be for people to call you father or to be a leader. Jesus is your master. God is your father. You are all brothers. He's saying, don't seek titles for yourself. And this is something we should ask ourselves. Does my leader or do I believe that I am above everyone else? Does my leader or do I believe that I shouldn't have to do certain things because I am more important than others? Jesus says, this isn't leadership according to his scale. This isn't what makes you, this isn't even what makes you great. He says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. So those who are trying to achieve these self-promoted or titles or respect or places of honor or um, uh, just prestige, whatever, in order to feel like they are great are actually the opposite. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Greatness is measured by service, not earthly honor. That is God's scale. And so he says, don't seek title, seek to be a servant. Luke twenty two twenty six. but it is not this way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. Romans 12, 3 says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Great people are great servants. Great people are great at making others important. Great people are great at making others better. Great people are great at lifting others up. Great people are great at helping others. Great people are great at not thinking they are great. Great people don't think about themselves much. He says, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. God will humble those who exalt themselves. And it's sad and it hurts. Not just them, it usually hurts others too. It's better to stay humble and to be exalted. The interesting thing is, when you're truly humble, you don't crave exaltation. And you may not notice it. You may not even want it. You want him to have all the glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this word. God, I pray that if uh, there is any spot or blemish in us, where we seek to be exalted and to take honor and glory and title and to steal worship and to create idolatry. God, if there's anything there, reveal it to us so we can change. Reveal it to us so that we can know. We want you to have all the glory. We want you to be honored, and we want to serve others as you ask us to. We love you, and we thank you for all that you're doing in our life. We are grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Have a great, great week, and uh, an awesome day of uh, college football as I'm recording this on Saturday and play it tomorrow. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week.